Hey everyone, let's talk about music therapy for a minute. And let me tell you, this is a big one. This is really, really, really important. So I hope you listen to this. Music was so instrumental in my recovery, guys. Um, and now maybe some of you will immediately say, ah, Dave, this doesn't apply to me. I'm not a musician and I'm not going to take the time to learn a musical instrument. Okay, fair enough. If that's, that's how you feel, listen to the rest of this. Hear me out, though. Hear me out. Because you may not need to learn how to play piano or guitar or something. There's ways to use music already that exists to help you. And if you're someone who's going to say, well, hold on, Dave, I can't listen to music. I'm too injured. I'm too, you know, I just can't do it. Just keep listening because, yes, I think there is a way around that. And I think it could be very therapeutic for you. I hear, so I hear all of those concerns. Just put them up front. We'll, get, we'll address them. But now let me tell you, music was instrumental in my recovery. I mean, there's just no... There's no other way to put it. I, I mean, it. I spent probably a good year before I came off benzos and probably three years post-benzo playing music obsessively, almost literally every day. Uh, I built a studio in my my uh, house. Yeah, I had equipment. Now, granted, I was a musician. I'd played music since I was 15 years old. When I first started playing guitar, I played drums. I played bass. I was a vocalist in bands growing up. I did live shows. So, yeah, I did have, I wasn't the greatest musician, but I had some music, uh, music was in my, in my blood, you know? So, but even before that, there was a period when I was tapering where I, I couldn't play guitar. I was, I felt brain damaged. I couldn't even remember chords and they hurt my finger and I had nothing but apathy and no joy. I mean, I didn't want to play guitar. I just didn't want to, and I couldn't. And I was no good, and it frustrated me. I had forgotten everything I had learned. It made me sad. I mean, playing guitar was like a trigger to me, if nothing else. But I started with just trying to introduce music. And and like a lot of us, I couldn't do it at first. I mean, there was a period where I couldn't watch movies. I couldn't have conversations. I couldn't listen to music. I was just in a shell shock state of benzo recovery. I had dropped 20 milligrams of benzo overnight of, of Valium. And it was like almost like a mini cold turkey effect. And I, I couldn't handle any of that stuff, right? So there is a time and place for this. But as I slowly started, but well, one thing I realized was I had to start reintroducing it because it wasn't just necessarily going to come back where I was just going to wake up and be better, you know? I, I had become so hyper aroused that, that, that I was so, so susceptible to any kind of overstimulation that I started retreating. I avoided, I isolated, I retreated. And those things became worse. That is always the formula, guys, by the way. Whatever scares you, you run away from, you avoid, becomes worse. But the caveat is, of course, that there are moments where you don't want to force that stuff. You know, maybe you should listen to your brain and you should reduce some of this stimulation for a little bit and let your nervous system calm down. So there is a time and place for this. Hear me on that. But usually we're not really the best people to decide that because once we're phobic about it, it never feels like the right time and place to reintroduce these things, right? I mean, there's people that are five years removed from benzos and their brains under a microscope or a, a CAT scan would show great improvements. They've had many tests done, cortisol levels, all of this stuff is returning back to normal. But guess what? They still can't drive their cars five years later. And they'll call it benzo withdrawal or protracted, but it's not even that. It's just a learned phobia in this limbic system. The amygdala is now afraid of driving and it, it hasn't been convinced that it's, you know, it's like, like getting out of a bad abusive relationship. It's not welcoming, welcoming this back. You got to show me things have changed. Well, how? You know, the proof is in the doing. That's the tough part, you know. So music, you know, if you're at that point where you can't, play music or even hear music, you could start to introduce it slowly. And, 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 and I mean, you could put on some nice, soft classical music, sleep music or something like that, and put it off in the distance. So it's almost like a white noise. And what happens, your, your limbic system will hear it. It will, it will slowly start to desensitize. It sees it's not a problem. There's nothing bad happening with this music. And we'll start to eliminate it from the, the roster of possible dangerous sub, you know, uh, uh, subjects or people or situations or stimulus like your limbic system has this is sort of like 
you know, uh, uh, the limbic's most wanted system, you know, or list. It's like this list of things the limbic system absolutely does not welcome. And then eventually that will get taken off that list and say, eh, subtle music in the background, some classical Mozart or Beethoven, not that big of a deal. I can handle that. And then you can slowly start to introduce it more and more and more. And then you start to turn that corner where, man, music really starting to f starts to f kind of feel good again, you know? And, and for me, it was a lot of sad songs. And initially I thought maybe that's bad, but if you do this research, if you look at the research on like sad music, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to become more depressed, right? It actually is just about feeling deeply. It's about accessing that good chemistry and accessing emotion, accessing that amygdala that's almost become, you know, cement. It's almost become frozen, like as if Medusa, as if, as if benzo withdrawal was Medusa and had turned the limbic and the amygdala to stone. Music starts to break that stone down, it starts to chip away, and it starts to let the colors come back in, and it starts to let the feeling come back in. And so for the last year of my taper, I had bought a guitar and, a, and a, a new amp and tried to put pressure on myself that I spent all this money I didn't have on this amp and guitar. Well, now, damn it, Dave, you got to play it, you know? And I did because I felt guilty. I was raised Catholic. I felt guilty, spent too much money on this stupid thing that I thought was stupid at the time because I was going through this. I thought it was selfish. No, it turned out to be one of the best investments of my life, really. And I started playing, and I sucked at first. I couldn't remember basic chords, and I felt like I was relearning how to play guitar all over again, as if i just come out of a coma and forgot everything. But I, then I started playing these sad songs. I started playing, so, not necessarily sad songs, but like songs like Wild Horses from the Stones. And I'd play it over and over and over again. And I played old Tom Petty songs, and, and I just, you know, songs that had lyrics and emotional uh, arrangements to the, to the chords you know, that, that were really charged with emotion. Songs that, that sung about sadness but offered a little bit of hope that just helped me process that. Because like, yeah, that's how I feel. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, for example. That was a lyric in a Tom Petty song and one of the songs that I had learned. And I remember just crying when I, when I was listening to it and trying to play it because I was like, ah, yes, it's speaking to my soul. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, damn it. And I needed to process that. I needed to purge it. I needed to feel that. I didn't need to repress that and then be sad and broken and feeling like Frankenstein's monster on the inside and not knowing how to repair any of this. I needed to purge all of that. But those songs slowly started to get more positive and more cheery and there was a mixed arrangement of things. And after I came off, I spent probably three years playing music. But there was a long time there that even if you, again, if you say, well, I don't play music, Dave. Okay, you don't have to learn to play music. But surely everybody loved music at some point. And it's kind of sad. The older we get, the less we listen to music. I mean, look at it. I mean, you probably listened to music when you were a teenager, or early 20s. You probably listened to it a lot. And at some point, we just stop. It just sort of leaves us. It's strange how that works. And I believe like when you're young as a teenager, teenage years are a crisis period of development. And I think we lean on music so much at that period to get us through. There's some kind of instinct there that we're using this music as almost a medicine. But as we get older, we get a little more jaded, we get a little busier. I don't know. Music just, it leaves. It just does, you know, for a lot of us anyway. But I say that's a mistake. Bring the music back. And listen to it slowly again. Engage in it. Find your best records. If you, you know, uh, maybe have a little bit of money, get you a record player. S buy some of your old favorite records. I mean, vinyl. You know, vinyl sounds amazing. Um, but if you don't want to do that, it, you know, there's tons of free music out there. I mean, you can literally access anything on the planet at this point on just YouTube alone, pretty much. Set time a day to listen to music, even if it's a few songs in the morning get you feeling emotion, get you feeling again. And I'll tell you, if you, if you do play music, maybe you played piano or, you know, guitar, and it's just been a long time, brush off the dust, get back to it, start small and just give it a chance because it's art therapy for one. And music therapy is, I mean, the, the, the neuroscience on music and what it does to the brain, how it shapes the brain, how it uh, creates new pathways in the brain, uh, how it increases gray matter volume, how it um, 
uh, you know, uh, accesses good chemistry, suppresses bad chemistry. It does amazing things. I mean, they've done studies on people with Alzheimer's, dementia, even that had forgotten their family and everything. And they would play them an old song from when they were, you know, a young adult, maybe in their 20s or their old wedding song. And suddenly, boom, this, this neural pathway is reemer reemerges and they can suddenly remember everything from their past that was dormant, that that doctor said they couldn't do any longer right music has this ability it's 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 so tied to the memory it's so tied to building neural pathways and like i said increasing gray matter volume which is lost during uh, a lot of that is lost or to a certain degree during you know going through benzo recovery going through profound depression panic trauma this this impacts the brain so music is neuroplasticity guys hear me on that it is neuroplasticity so if you want to help re your recovery, introduce music. If you really want to help your recovery, learn to play music. And here's another reason why. Because anytime you learn something new, not even just music, anytime you introduce something new to the nervous system, you're causing uh, a, a great amount of neuroplasticity. You're causing neur neural uh, resilience to start to form. New neurons are forming because of the new experiences. Now, this doesn't always, this doesn't happen so much with things that we're already familiar with. And I tell people, if you're going for walks every day uh, in the same trail in the same spot, your brain at first, when it's new, you'll get this boost of neuroplasticity. You're right. You'll get this, you know, this growth of synapses. But then after you get a, you, you get a, you adapt to it. Well, the brain slows down that process. It can stop. It doesn't really introduce new stuff anymore. So you have to go to a new place to walk, a new environment. You could even, I, I talk about this with a lot of clients, you could even get on Google Maps and just travel around. I did this for two years. I would go to the Eiffel Tower and just cruise up and down the streets and see what Paris looked like. You know, on Google Maps, you could just see what every street looks like. Look at the Eiffel Tower from different angles. Angles. I go visit the Great Pyramids. I would go see the Great Wall of China, the North Pole, Antarctica. I would just... I, I was constantly taking in new stimulus and figuring out what do houses look like in Sweden? What do houses look like in London? What do houses look like in California? What do houses look like in Iraq? You know, China. I, I, there's, there's such a big world out there. And I was constantly trying to take in new information, learning new things, learning new, and now going back to music, learning new songs, learning new chords, learning new scales, learning, you know, listening to new music learning about the musicians that I loved. I mean, these were, this was all new information and it was all positively impacting my nervous system. So again, music therapy, guys, do not take it lightly. Don't overlook it. It is a, I think it's a must. I really think it's a must in this. Uh, and again, it's how you get there. Maybe you need to desensitize your nervous system to it. Maybe you don't play music, but you can dig out some old vinyl or, or find some music online that you might like. Maybe you use it to help you sleep, but if you can't learn to play an instrument, you're going to have double the effect because you're learning something new and you're accessing music, right? So it's, it's the best. And, I, and really my advice is to learn, learn an instrument. It's not that hard. Grab a little keyboard. You can get on Amazon. You can get, pick up a guitar for under a hundred dollars, maybe $50 used. You know, there's these little triangles and these, there's interesting little instruments that don't have to be very complicated at all that you can play. Um, a little djembe drum that you can beat on. That's amazing for recovery. I mean, just the drum alone, we could talk about for a half hour, what it does to the brain, how it, how the brain uh, syncs up to the rhythm of the drum, how it channels. Uh, it, it's, it's just uh, some amazing stuff there. So. If you guys don't take it from me, do a Google search on neuroplasticity and music. Just type in music and neuroplasticity and look what comes up. 